right, and as a brief recap, did have a few uh, attendees filter on in here in the past couple of minutes. This webinar will be recorded, but your cameras and microphones are both turned off. Keep an eye out for the follow-up survey being sent tomorrow, including both the recording of the webinar and a link to the follow-up survey. And lastly, please submit any questions uh, and or, and or <laughs> comments in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen instead of the chat box. And without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. So before we dive into the material tonight, I'd like to take a step back and essentially consider where we're at in the season, right? And so we did receive a couple of questions regarding general order of operations, and I do believe it's beneficial just to essentially consider where we're at, right? So we've, we're have we exiting the winter and the spring here, right? So I'd say in the winter time when we truly don't expect much energy uh, per se to be required, so not necessarily looking to see fertilize, mow, water, et cetera. Um, and heading into the springtime, let's say once temps are starting to warm up to the 60 degree range or so, up into the 70s, the grass still hasn't reached its maximum growth rate yet, right? Might be starting to green up a little bit. We might be starting to consider some of these cultural practices, um, but we're still not quite at the point in the season where we expect to be completing the majority of these actions. And so with the summer, we're getting into this time period where we are expecting to be able to complete some of these actions and then also transitioning into the most difficult uh, portion of the year, right? So as the temps start to reach up uh, into the 80 degree range, some of our attendees tonight believe we're, we are most likely already past that point where some of our other attendees are getting right to that point. Um, this is when the, if you have a warm season grass, the grass is really going to be starting to take off. But once we start to transition more so into the 90, 100 degree range, you'll start to see that grass start to slow down, right? Um, so just keep in mind in the summertime, this doesn't necessarily need, uh, mean that it's a time period to be completing each and every action, right? At the early part here, that's really when the grass is going to be taking off, but then it may start to slow down before essentially uh, beginning to hit its maximum growth rate again right around uh, early fall or so once the temps start to drop back into that 80 degree range before ultimately uh, entering a, a dormancy or a winter dormancy essentially as the temps start to drop again. So with everything discussed tonight, just keep in mind that we're right in that time period where we're going, there's going to be a window where we can complete several actions, but then also prepping for that time period where we are going to have to essentially take a step back and uh, essentially mon monitor the lawn a bit more and not necessarily uh, be taking such a hands-on approach per se. So what does this mean? Um, if you've attended our Lawn Care Basics webinar, you'll have heard us chat about watering, mowing, and fertilizing. Well, with watering, this is most likely going to be the period where we are watering the most, right? So if we were to think of this almost as like traffic lights, <laughs> where green means go, this is really an action that we want, uh, we expect to be increasing for the most part. This doesn't mean that we're going to be increasing it too much, right? Where we could run into issues such as uh, potential disease concerns. Uh, we still want to maintain a deep and infrequent watering schedule where applicable, but Yvonne will expand upon this in just a moment. Um, and on the other extreme, we can picture mowing, right? And almost as a red light. This doesn't mean you won't mow at all, but we most likely may see the mowing frequency drop a bit. And so one of the questions we'll receive is, my grass doesn't seem to be growing quite as quickly, or I don't seem to have to mow quite as much. Is this a bad thing? And that isn't necessarily a bad, um, a bad factor to observe. Right? Thirdly, from a fertilizing perspective, put a yellow light here. So not necessarily an increase, but not necessarily a decrease, right? We're going to have to keep an eye on the environment, the weather, and uh, we'll expand upon this a, a bit more on the coming slides as well. And then lastly, we'll close uh, tonight with an investigate slide. So essentially, what are some changes to keep an eye out for over the course of the year? If you are following all these practices, if what changes can we still expect to see, right? There's always the possibility that no matter how much we're completing, we can always see certain areas start to change a little bit, right? Just due to the variability in the, the environment itself, even within one lot. All right, so first thing we're gonna discuss would be our watering. Um, this is typically the most important thing um, that you're going to see in your lawn that you're really going to need to keep on top of. You know, it's not just running your sprinklers, it's making sure you have enough water that you're not having too much. It's very much is a balancing act. And 
it'll get easier over time, but for now, here are some really good guidelines for you to follow. Um, basically, your lawn wants about an inch of water per week, um, and that can increase with temperatures or decrease. Right now, you're probably watering about once a week. Um, it wants, you know, half an inch per session. Um, so usually in the early mornings, you know, watering, making sure it's not evaporating as it gets too hot outside. Um, and this, of course, can change. So if you need to add an extra watering because it's getting too hot outside, you can go up to an inch and a half per week. But we wouldn't encourage going more than three times a week um, as the grass isn't really going to be doing as much with that water. It can lead to some fungal issues um, and things like that. Um, and when we mention session, it is going to be that day. So a session is typically, you know, a session on Monday, a session on Wednesday, a session on Friday. Um, and within that, um, a lot of kind of southwestern areas do have a harder soil because it doesn't get that regular rain that keeps it um, hydrophilic. So it's actually trying to repel water sometimes. So with that, um, you may need to adjust your watering schedule to where it kind of waters in short bursts, but kind of over that same period of time. So if you have an hour for your watering, as far as you know, the county restrictions go, you know, water for five minutes, stop for five minutes, water for five minutes and so on. This will encourage the soil to actually take in that water instead of letting it run off. Um, it's the same practice kind of behind flood irrigation that you may see in some more agricultural parts of Arizona. Um, so that's just something to think about um, what kind of soil you have. If you've got a more sandy soil, then you know it's gonna take in that water a little bit more easily. You can run the sprinkler for the allotted time um, and then you know, just continue on that way. Um, you know, and a lot of those, these areas in the Southwest are going to have watering restrictions going into the summer. Most likely it's gonna be once or twice a week, um, early morning or late at night. They just wanna make sure that you're watering smartly. And with you know, soil health, with grass health, it is always better to water deeply and infrequently. So encouraging those deep roots. So typically the watering restrictions aren't gonna to be too harsh. If you can still water once a week, your grass should be just fine. Um, actually I was reading today, St. Augustine can last up to three weeks without water. So if you do need to hunker down and just not water your lawn for a little bit, longest you can go is around three weeks. So just making sure you're following restrictions still, even though you want your grass to look great, just keep in mind that there are environmental conditions that it might not be possible. In some areas, you know, it will get too hot for that grass to grow and it may enter into a summer dormancy. This is what we call going gold. You'll start to see it, um, not exactly brown, but yeah, turn that kind of straw, golden color. It's not the air grass is dying, it's just protecting itself from that extreme heat condition. Um, you can stave this off for a little bit by encouraging deeper rooting in your grass, deeply and frequent watering. Um, but for the most part, you know, it's inevitable for certain areas, parts of Texas, it's just gonna happen, parts of Arizona, New Mexico. Um, so just knowing that it's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just kind of a thing. Um, and for, you know, the rest of the watering, it is possible to water in the evening for certain areas. This is not something I would recommend for like a South Texas. Um, so I know we have some folks from San Antonio. Um, I would keep with the morning waterings in that case, but for somewhere more dry, more arid like Arizona or New Mexico. Um, you can actually get away with evening waterings and this might help your grass um, kind of absorb it before it gets um, too hot outside and it starts to evaporate. Eva, we did have a, a few questions here, right? And okay. to your point of essentially finding this balance, right? Of uh, watering, ma maintaining a healthy lawn without having the water bill become astronomical, right? Or is it a, a losing battle? So what are your thoughts there in terms of, should we try to maintain that green lawn throughout the entire season? Or is it better to essentially, if we have to, like you said, essentially allow it to go gold for a period of time and really focus on prioritizing the other uh, times of the year? I think in the most extreme places, it's going to kind of go gold no matter what. So like, you know, I mentioned Phoenix is a valley. It's all that heat is just lowering itself onto that area. Um, central or more west to central Texas is going to get very hot. It's very likely that the grass is just not going to be able to grow. Um, but some other areas, you know, east Texas, a little bit more central or north Texas, um, you can stave off thawing gold probably for the for the most part of the summer. Um, but again, you don't want to water any more than three times a week because all it's going to do is just invite, you know, fungal issues or um, bacterial formation. And one other question. So in terms of providing water, amount of water per session and knowing when to water, right? So what would we recommend from an audit perspective, right? Or yeah. um, a, a timing? <laughs> Yeah, so for watering, um, everybody's irrigation system is different, which is why we don't typically recommend a uh, timing. So David, I do see your question down there. This does pertain to that. So just knowing um, kind of how much water your ir irrigation system outputs. So 
good rule of thumb is to just take out like a tuna can or if you have sprinkler gauges, something like that, put those out in your lawn and then run your sprinklers um, and then time it, you know, run them for 30 minutes and see how much water you're getting in, in that um, container. And that's how much water output you'll get for that amount of time. So for example, it takes mine about 45 minutes to get to half an inch. Um, so I run my sprinklers for 45 minutes per session. Um, and again, if your area is very arid, you can get away with evening waterings, but if it is somewhere that stays a little bit more humid, I'm in Austin, it's a little sweaty right now, I'm not gonna be watering in the evening, morning waterings are what I'm gonna stick to. Thank you. Yeah. And mowing. So mowing is kind of insidiously important. People don't really think about it. You know, you just mow your lawn when you can, when you need to, um, and then just kind of forget about it after that. Um, but there are things there that can help um, keep your lawn a little bit greener over the summer and keep it a little bit healthier and a little bit more um, drought resistant. Uh, so the most important thing I would say is just to sharpen your mower blades. Um, this isn't something you have to do frequently, but at least once a season, we highly recommend it. Also washing them with a little bit of dish soap would just help any sort of fungal or disease spread as well. Um, so, you know, usually when you get your mower out the first of the season, that's when I like to sharpen mine. And we do have a great resource on our blog about sharpening them. So if it seems a little daunting at first, Rest assured, it's on the website. We try to make it as easy to follow as possible. Um, but this does get into, you know, only cut as needed. Um, we don't want to cut your lawn very, very short if it's a grass that is a little bit more help, healthy at a longer height. St. Augustine likes to be tall. You know, it likes to be cut three to four inches. So keeping it at that height will keep it a little bit healthier. It will give it more nutrients, the things it needs to survive in the heat. Um, Bermuda grass, it's going to need a look to be a little bit shorter. It likes being, you know, if it's a hybrid Bermuda, it likes to be an inch tall. If it's a regular Bermuda, it likes to be around two inches. Um, so just knowing what kind of grass you have and where it's at its healthiest is really important as well. Um, and then with that, don't cut too much of the grass off. If you're lazy like me and you just forget and it gets, keeps getting taller and taller, you know, raise your, your lawnmower and then just gradually cut it shorter. You don't want to cut more than a third of the, grade, the grass blade off Per session or per mow, just because you want to keep it healthy. It does ignite more of a stress response. You know, it does anyway. That's the smell of uh, fresh cut grass, but you do want to mitigate a little bit. You just want to cut a very small amount off each time. And <clears throat> my, you, you touched on this a bit, and I realized I uh, meant to expand upon this in the watering slide as well, right? So, from a weed perspective, um, mowing is really a critical practice. Right, this can be a it may lead to a huge uh, impact over the course of the season, especially during the summer, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So knowing, um, I always, you know, if you don't know the type of grass you have, you haven't been able to find that out yet. Always err on the side of mowing a little bit higher. Um, this improves your resistance to weeds. Weeds really like they need that sun to germinate those seeds. So if you're making sure that your grass is thick, it's full, it's tall, it's not going to allow as many weed seeds to flourish. Um, and the same thing with making sure your mower blade is sharp, um, keeping it sharp mitigates the stress response um, and, you know, just making sure that it's not stressed, it's not, you know, it's able to kind of take over where those weeds might. Um, as far as watering goes, that's another reason why you only want to water at most three times a week. It's just because um, you don't want the weeds to use that excess water. Um, and, you know, the same thing with being able to water a little bit more if you can. Um, so if you do have those restrictions, making sure if you water at least once a week, it'll keep some of those more drought loving weeds at bay as well. And David, that's also a great question. Um, this is something I was gonna touch on with the weeds as well. So thank you for reminding me. Um, so grass cycling, which is leaving the clippings on your lawn, um, that's usually a really helpful practice. Um, it leaves those nutrients in the, um, in the ecosystem of your lawn. The only caveat to that is if you have a lot of weeds. So mowing when you have a lot of weeds, we do recommend bagging your clippings, making sure to get those weed seeds or any other material that might be able to sprout out of your lawn and away from that environment, just to make sure that they're not going to be spreading like crazy. And you can compost these um, clippings or you can just take them out with the, the green waste at the end of the week, um, but just making sure that you're not giving the weeds more of a chance to spread. So in short, it depends. <laughs> As with everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ivana. So, all right. So, transitioning to fertilizing, right? And so, like I said, if we viewed uh, watering and mowing as being the two extremes, fertilizing is really going to be the in between. Um, so, one of the questions that we're, we'll receive is, well, should I fertilize during the summer? <laughs> Perfect example. It depends. 
Um, so you'll see built out on your plan, on your My Plan page, you'll ha have a set of nutrient pouches over the course of the season with recommended application dates, right? So knowing what to apply, My Plan plate page is a great resource. Knowing when to apply, however, can become a bit more complicated. And so while these application dates are a great starting point, this does assume that the grass is going to benefit from the application. So what do I mean by this? Well, the first question we want to ask is, what is the current temperature, right? And so if it is extremely warm, so let's say during the day it's getting up over 100, we would not want to be outside applying the nutrient pouch uh, during the peak of the day, right, or during peak heat. So what we could do to circumvent this is to apply in the early morning uh, and or late at night, right, when it's a little bit cooler. Now, the reason I wouldn't default to this is just because we do still want to make sure that the grass is healthy and essentially actively growing, right? So as Ivana touched on earlier, if the lawn is going gold and we're essentially allowing it to almost enter a summer dormancy, I would rather hold on to those nutrient pouches for later in the season, right? Allow that grass to recover, essentially conserve its resources. And then once uh, the temps start to drop a little bit and it conducive growth, then we can begin to incorporate these pouches again as the season progresses. So always feel free, like you said, uh, these application dates are a great starting point, but we're always happy to provide an updated schedule for you if uh, we need to adjust them slightly, right? With Even under perfect conditions, you could have a, a let's say a thunderstorm, <laughs> uh, potentially a bit more odd in uh, drier climates, but certainly, um, certainly a possibility, right? So in terms of the Sunday tip, you may hear us chat about lawn aid or see uh, this pouch available on our website. It's a great pouch for, um, or in the lens of a, essentially a summer preventive heat uh, stress treatment. So this is ideally a pouch which would be put down prior to the summer heat um, and then can be applied every four to six weeks or so during the season, right? And so what we typically look at, this is not a pouch that is going to be included in uh, your custom lawn plan, since it doesn't contain any nitrogen, it's not going to encourage uh, that new grass growth per se, but it will just help uh, with the summer heat. So this is a, a pouch to consider, again, not necessarily a, a requirement, but something to keep in mind if you're interested. And well, we did have a couple questions pertaining to um, the fertilizing section of this presentation, and one is just for customers who are on a little bit of an accelerated schedule, you know, if they're going on vacation or they're moving or something, you know, what are some good guidelines for them to follow? Yeah, really, really good question. So again, always feel free to reach out if you have any specific questions, but with an accelerated schedule, our primary focus is as long as the lawn can benefit from the application, we just need to wait anywhere between seven to 10 days or so to, before incorporating an additional pouch. So from an over-fertilization perspective, as long as we allow the seven to 10 days, we can begin incorporating those pouches. So let's just say if you had um, a pouch to apply in June, July, and August, but you were heading out of town by the end of June, we get to potentially incorporate a pouch at the beginning of June, uh, a week, week and a half later, apply the pouch month for July, and then incorporate the third pouch a week or so afterwards. Now, ideally, I would say, you know, we could start with the June pouch and then hold on to the July and the August pouches for later in the season. We could really adjust that as needed. But I would say that the biggest priority is just making sure that we don't apply them all at once or too closely together. Great question, though. Yeah, and Will, but, um, for people who have, you know, maybe some other alternative ground covers or maybe there's some weeds that they actually really like having, um, are our pouches okay for uh, things like that? Are they going to harm them or anything? Another really good question. So from one perspective, right, fertilizer is fertilizer. And to a certain extent, most plants are going to require fairly similar nutrients, right? But keep in mind that these pouches are designed specifically for turf grass, right? So we do not recommend applying these pouches to, let's say, clover or um, specific uh, garden uh, plants, for example. We do offer a separate product called Wonderfur, but that's a separate separate story. So nutrient pouches with your custom lawn plan are only designed for turf grass. They do not carry um, herbicides, though. So, you know, if you do have some of those weeds in your lawn that you do enjoy having, um, the fertilizer pouches themselves have no herbicides, so you won't um, need to be very careful when applying them. It's really only our herbicides like dandelion, doomer, weed warrior um, that would cause harm to, to those things like clover. Um, 
Yeah, and then one other question, Will. Um, we have some customers, you know, it's spring. Uh, they're installing some new grass, some new sod. Um, how long do you think they should wait between installing uh, their sod and applying their first application? Yeah, another really good question. So we can really, um, it, it, again, it depends. <laughs> so if the entire lawn is being sodded, then our biggest focus is that sod is typically installed pretty well for lawns, right? So we just want to make sure that we allow enough time prior to applying our nutrient pouches. So typically, we would say we want that sod to root. Um, so essentially, pull or passing a, a pull test, if you will. So if you were to lightly tug uh, on the sod, once it's well rooted, we could then start discussing applying the nutrient pouches. Typically translates, what would you say, about a few weeks to yeah. a little bit longer or so? Yeah, three to four weeks. Perfect. Yeah. All really good questions. Yeah, we could certainly spend <laughs> an entire presentation on or entire webinar on uh, fertilizer. So please feel free to continue submitting questions. But all right, so transitioning to the investigate slide here, right? So despite um, following mowing recommendations, watering recommendations, et cetera, you still start to notice changes develop in the lawn, right? And what I always try to highlight customers is that this doesn't mean that you necessarily did something wrong, right? There's some situations which it could be a portion lawn might be a bit more compacted, for example, which can lead to a separate host of issues and we could see changes develop a, a bit more quickly. So what we really encourage here is being mindful of essentially the environment, the lawn itself, and from there we'll be best able to determine how to proceed, right? So firstly, considering environmental conditions, if you start to notice a change in lawn, so let's just say browning or yellowing, for example, could it be the temps have spiked over the past few weeks? If we've gone from essentially 70 degree weather up to 90 degrees or 100 degrees, could be a factor. Uh, has there been a change in the amount of natural precipitation? Too much could lead to disease concerns. Um, too little can lead to, to heat stress or essentially browning in these areas as well. Also consider, however, have you audited your sprinkler system recently? And if you haven't, could this area essentially be, again, receiving too much water or too little water? What we sometimes see is we'll take a look at a lawn and we'll see areas where uh, the majority of the lawn looks healthy, right? But then there's a specific portion that isn't. We're racking our brains trying to figure out what could be occurring. It doesn't seem to be receiving any more sunshine, uh, any more shade, et cetera. And then we realize that the sprinkler head in that area hasn't been uh, covering the area, area or has been covering it too much. So once you're considering these changes, we highly recommend keeping track of them, right? So keeping a journal essentially or a diary of the changes throughout the lawn. Um, if you notice an area start to change and then it begins to expand, it's great to be able to have that timeline of uh, it started here on this date and then it seemed to progress by this date, right? Or it all seemed to take place at once. Um, and didn't hasn't expanded since then. This is all great information uh, to have when chatting with uh, one of the yard advisors here at Sunday. We always love being able to have those details. And so what we'll then start to consider is essentially what is the issue, right? So if we look uh, in the upper right-hand corner here, if we start to see patches develop, um, could be a sign of compacted soil, essentially limiting root establishment and the grass being more susceptible to heat stress. It could be a sign of uh, mowing a little bit lower, right? So if it's an uneven lawn, one area, you know, an area essentially being cut a little bit too low uh, by that blade, despite having a high mower height, right? Just based on essentially how the lawn um, lays. But if it if the area has weak roots, so for example, if you start to notice yellowing and then you pull up on the grass and it seems like it has no resistance, it could be a turf grass pest such as grubs, uh, chinch bugs, depending on uh, type of grass as well. So with pest pressure, this is a, a key area where we would not default to applying fertilizer, right? If we start to notice a change of the lawn, the initial reaction should not be, okay, I need to accelerate my schedule like we discussed before, right? And get a pouch down. While it's possible that there are, you know, yellowing in the lawn can correlate to essentially wanting to get another pouch down, this typically is not the case. And we can most likely exacerbate the underlying stressor or issue by applying that uh, nutrient pouch. Secondly, if the area is spongy or discolored, it could be a fungus. Ivana touched on this uh, earlier in the, the webinar tonight. So essentially, typically expect with very humid, wet uh, conditions, we can see fungal bloom. 
Um, so essentially, if the grass is stressed, uh, the pathogens present in the environment is conducive, then we'll see these blooms uh, take hold. Typically, uh, as long as one of those factors is broken, so for example, if we modify the environment, um, then we will not no longer see this bloom. So in most situations, we do not need to resort to a fungicide, but we can always chat about this if any questions arise. Uh, key focus here is that in most situations, if you apply a pouch um, to an area experiencing a bloom, will most likely exacerbate uh, the issue. So again, the default reaction would not be to apply the pouch, but we would consider essentially looking at close-up photos of the grass blades themselves, uh, as shown in the image in the middle of the screen here, uh, and checking the amount of water uh, collecting this area, if it could be a watering schedule concern uh, or a compaction concern, essentially limiting drainage. And lastly, if uh, the lawn seems dry, almost adopting that going gold look uh, that was highlighted earlier, footprints remain in the lawn, then this could be a sign of drought stress, right? And so to a certain extent, depending on the time of year, maybe a, a, um, a factor which we're comfortable with, right? And essentially allowing that lawn uh, to enter that summer dormancy and um, proceeding from there. But if it's just a portion of the lawn or if it's not at the point where uh, we are in an environment where we need to allow the lawn to go gold, then we can essentially chat about watering schedules uh, to make sure that we alleviate uh, the drought stress in this situation. And then lastly, we create an action plan. So again, the key takeaway from this slide is there are always factors which can arise over the course of the season, right? And so being able to understand what's occurring, is this a change in uh, the temps, right? Is it my watering schedule? Is it my mowing height? Is it pest pressure? Is it uh, a separate factor will allow us to be better able to respond and develop a, a path for moving forward, right? Which typically is not to uh, apply fertilizer. So I realize that I am over here. So I truly apologize for running over. We'll uh, do our best to wrap this up shortly. But um, like I said, we'll, we'll be sending out our recording here uh, tomorrow. So no, no worries if you have to, to dip. Um, one other factor that I did want to address is weed, uh, weed growth, right? And so we had started to chat about this uh, from a mowing perspective, but crabgrass, for example, is a one of those weeds that everybody loves. Um, typically a sign of uh, having a, since crabgrass is a pretty shallow root system, typically very dry area, right? And we tend to see it pop up uh, in the summertime. So from one perspective, we want to make sure that essentially we have as thick of a grass canopy as possible. So uh, maintaining that high mowing height where applicable, repairing any bare or thinner areas. Um, if the timing is correct and essentially just crowding out those weeds. Now, the reason I say here, if the timing is correct during the summertime, keep in mind that we did not discuss repairing, right? And if you take a look at one of our uh, previous Lawn Care Basics webinars or Order of Operations, we spend a significant portion of time chatting about repairing the lawn. Once we start to get into that 90 degree range or so, it's going to be a bit too warm to be looking at repairing the lawn. So this is really a period of time where we'd be considering evaluating the current state of the lawn, determining why uh, we're seeing these changes and develop a plan for moving forward, right? And ensure that we're in a better position uh, next season. We did have um, a few questions from um, some of the registration questions we haven't gotten to. There were a couple I wanted to touch on really quickly um, because shallowly they're from Texas and I wanted to make sure my Texans were taken care of, but um, they do have to do with um, Texas soils and this goes for a lot of Southwestern areas, Arizona, New Mexico can sometimes have clay soils. Um, Colorado for sure has some clay areas as well. Um, so for those areas, it is a lot harder for grasses to develop those deep roots to fight off any sort of stress, um, stressors like drought or heat. Um, so for those areas, it is recommended to aerate, you know, at least once a year just to break up that clay a little bit, but follow that up with top dressing um, and when it is cooler in the spring. So that would be with um, some topsoil or compost and you can do this in the fall as well. Um, but what that does is just start to incorporate more organic matter into the soil. It makes it a healthier environment for your grass and it makes your grass more able to tolerate anything that you know the environment throws at it so just want to make sure you know there are options for people with soils that aren't great um you know hop dressing is something i do every year right, let's see what other questions do we have so we had our, our texas questions um
there is one um, that kind of goes a little bit more into order of operations, but it is helpful to note. Um, you know, when you sign up with a plan with us, we kind of make sure to let you know to treat your weeds first and then fertilize after that. Um, but that is also something that you need to do kind of over the course of the season as well. So it's not just a one and done weed treatment. You will start to see stuff pop up, you know, seeds are going to blow in from that abandoned lot nearby, things like that. Um, the kids walking past your house will blow the dandelion seeds into your lawn. Um, so just making sure, you know, as you go throughout the season, um, you can still use your weed control. You just want to make sure to keep a 24 hour buffer between that and any other applications just to make sure that, you know, it has time to work. Um, and that way you're not going to be battling a whole bunch of weeds come next season. All right, looks like we did have a question as well regarding dethatching. Um, so if you do see a buildup of uh, grass, typically a sign of a pretty heavy fertilization schedule or a significant amount of nitrogen over the course of the year. So generally with the Sunday plan, uh, we typically don't see a significant amount of thatch buildup, right? But really, uh, what are your thoughts there? Typically anywhere from, I mean, St. Augustine, probably about half an inch or so to maybe an inch for some of the cool season grasses. Yeah, anywhere up to an inch of thatch is just fine. Um, anything over that does impede, you know, fertilizer moving into the soil or water or anything like that. Um, but as far as dethatching, I wouldn't worry about it if you have any less than an inch. Um, and I would only try to do that about once, um, once a season. And notes regarding having dogs and getting the lawn uh, rebuilt. So certainly a great question, right? It can be one of the uh, more difficult components here. Um, and we can, you know, potentially connect on this offline as well, chat about it in more detail. But, you know, our biggest focus is essentially if we can get grass reestablished in a portion of the yard. So whether it's uh, fencing off a portion of the lawn um, or, you know, just tackling it in chunks, that would really be ideal, right? Rather than trying to uh, tackle the entire lawn and have it exposed to the dog traffic, uh, for example, and then end up with a less than ideal, uh, less than ideal results. Right? Yeah, if you can, you know, do 50-50, just fence off half the lawn, you know, repair it, make it, get it to a good place, and then you can allow them back there and switch. Um, if you have the space, you know, you could do quarters, just rotate the different quarters, um, but it's just kind of up to, you know, the effort you want to deal with having to take your dogs on walks if you're going to be repairing the lawn and such. But we can definitely chat more about it. I'd be happy to chat about it. I love talking about dogs. Um, then it looks like we also had another question about um, leveling low spots on the lawn. Um, and this is a really good practice to do more in the spring or fall. Again, you want to be mindful of your temperatures. And part of that is because um, when leveling, you kind of want to use a mix of some organic matter and sand, but organic matter itself stays very hot. You know, that's how compost works. So you want to be mindful of the temperatures when you're doing this. So, you know, if it is starting to warm up there, if it's getting into the 80s, I would just hold off until fall. Um, we do have a great article, David, and I can send you that after the webinar. Um, but basically, you can just start doing this um, in spring or in fall, just um, putting a little bit over those areas, not smothering the grass there, but just a little bit over time to build them up. Right, and I think the last one that, that I've missed here, uh, let me know if I, I missed any others, but um, in regards to clover and other weeds, what can we do to prevent them every year? And if the opportunity has been missed, how to get rid of them or essentially prevent them from, from moving forward, right? So as we started to touch on on this slide here, uh, we're right about at that point, depending on where you're at, the, getting into that time frame where um, we may be just past the point of being able to repair the lawn, right? Or we might be heading right, having a, a fairly short window. So our biggest focus here is essentially some of these weeds are going to die off during the summertime. Um, some of the bigger focus is essentially going to be if we can't uh, treat them and repair the areas uh, to minimize the amount of bare soil and essentially the amount of sunlight, uh, if you will, as Ivana touched upon earlier, um, then maybe we essentially just mow while bagging our clippings to. Uh, prevent any further spread of viable seed rather than trying to treat with an herbicide and get grass reestablished if the environment's not conducive, right? And we can essentially uh, prioritize on maintaining this area either later this season, depending on your grass type, or uh, next year uh, as well. Vaughn, did, did we miss any there? I think mm -hmm. that. Those were the questions. There was one um, chatting about shade with some oak trees um, with St. Augustine. Typically, St. Augustine can do very well under oak trees. It's just a little bit more work 
Um, so just doing things like making sure to rake out um, those leaves, especially if it's a live oak, um, just getting those out of there. Um, but for the most part, shade is just fine. You just need to maybe add a little bit, um, you know, a little bit of muscle. Well, all right, everyone, please feel free uh, to submit any questions. Uh, we'll still be here for a couple minutes here while we're wrapping up. But uh, just a reminder, this was, uh, Ivana, I'm blanking on the name here. We got prepping for a better better summer, Southwest. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, so with the, the follow-up survey, please select that title for us. Uh, again, no worries if you accidentally close out of the, the survey or if you're unable to complete it tonight. You'll be receiving that in the follow-up email, but it was an absolute pleasure chatting with you all. Uh, our team is available um, seven days a week at webinars at getsunday.com. So feel free to send in any questions uh, which do arise moving forward to that email address. But aside from that, again, truly appreciate you all being here tonight. Hope to see you at another webinar and uh, have a great rest of your night. Take care. Okay. Take care, y'all. Have a good one.